Welcome to the Northwest Community Garden, located at the corner of Park and Baxter Streets. The Rutland Department of Parks and Rec administers two such gardens, which are open to members of the community to plant and grow their own produce. Over the next few months, we will feature the progress of this garden, from soil preparation, seeding, pruning, and the final harvest. Our garden guide is Nicholas Santoro. Welcome back to Gardeners Grow Community. I'm Gail, and this is our garden guru, Nick. Well, Nick, what is new in the garden today? Oh, wow, we've been doing quite a few things. Uh, all the seedlings are coming up. Uh, the uh, dragons... Tongue. Tongue beans are profuse. The, uh, uh, these beautiful peas behind me are coming up nicely, and my preferred carrots are coming up right over here. And, and since last time, uh, things are starting to get green in the garden. There's Linda, who has a plot. Uh, and the chips have been put down by the youth team over there at the rec department. And then uh, Tyler and Conrad, with me, uh, with minor assistance and direction, install these marble benches, which we're sitting on now. And uh, it's uh, one of the additions that are happening here. And, uh, and uh, they need a lot of sanding, because in the process of drilling and pinning, uh, one of the tops, it's, it had a crack, so I had to go over to the quarry and uh, buy a, another slab, and so it needs a lot of sanding. So we're happy to have them here at the moment. We're very fortunate it's early in the day and we have nice shade and uh, uh, just great to have these benches. <laughs> Say, Nick, I noticed a little yellow bucket over there by the other uh, bench. How is that going to help us? Well, uh, I spray painted the bucket yellow, and then uh, with my permanent magic marker, I wrote sanding stones. And uh, the sanding stones are used, first you start with the coarsest grade on the roughest edges and you work your way to smoother stones uh, along those same edges. It's very repetitive, continuous work. And so I hope to bring a table and put it in between the two benches and uh, get some fold-up chairs so that people can gather easily here for uh, anything. So you're using stones in the place of sandpaper? To start, uh, sandpaper uh, can be used too, but there are different types of uh, stones and you can take old uh, uh, sanding discs and those usually work for different purposes. What kind of stone do you prefer to use as sanding? Well, uh, there are these wedges that can be uh, found or purchased that are on the, the big polishing machines that are like four feet around, excuse me, that uh, sand big surfaces and there's a series of wedges of different grits and those are the best. They're so cool. <laughs> they're cool right at the moment. They're nice and cool. Well I've noticed several things in the garden that are not plants that looks like people have installed either for height or possibly protection against those pesky critters that decide to eat the produce before we even get it harvested. Well I think they're all meant for uh, uh, 
plants to climb on. And so I think there's some, uh, uh, I think those are cucumbers, but I'm not sure. And then I can't tell. Some of them look like teepees and some look like strange geometric shapes and even maybe uh, some kind of mesh or screen. Yeah. I would like to know what is, is good because I have a problem with critters eating up my beans in my little home garden. Hmm. Well, I was uh, driving uh, uh, Grove Street Extended and uh, stopped at uh, Gallipo and uh, she had some incredible plants growing there and she said that that she just relies upon rain and it's it really astonished me. Anyhow, uh, I missed my point. <laughs> well, I brought some little casual containers to carry the uh, dragon's tongue. Great. I I'd like to, to take some home with me. And then you can plant the others wherever you think they'll uh, breathe the most fire. Well, we'll uh, basically try to keep them there and I'll spread them out. Okay, Nick, can, can you tell me how do we go about actually transplanting these little seedlings? so that I can carry them home safely? Well, I'm going to use my favorite digging device, which is that, a screwdriver? that screwdriver with the point on it now, and, and go down and loosen up the roots so that I can gently ease them out of their germinating home, and you can take them away and, and put them in some new homes, new soil. And have you decided where they're going to go in this garden? I think what we'll do is we'll spread them out where they are. Uh, uh, we have a bunch of uh, uh, Brussels sprouts and there's an area in there and we'll start spreading them in, uh, out so that we can harvest them in a fairly short time. So next time do you think we're going to have to do that ugly chore that nobody wants called weeding. Well, we finally reached that stage where it's a definitive improvement to have uh, more hands uh, uh, plucking those weeds because they're ever growing. <laughs> okay, we hope to see you then. And today is furrow number four. Thank you. We'll see you again. How about that thumb there, that green thumb? <laughs> Welcome back, amateur gardeners. Today we have a special treat, a special guest, in fact, Mr. Mike Gay, who is a local farmer and one of the best. Tell me, Mike, what is the name of your farm? Enchanted Flora Farm. And where is it located? Uh, down at the very, very tail end of Door Drive. The uh, first farm into Rutland Town, out of Rutland City. Do you have specific hours posted that people could come and visit? I only do uh, visitations by appointment. I'm a shared living provider for a young man with autism, and that is where I spend a lot of my time. And I do my stuff at the farm early mornings, late nights. I'm like, I tell people I'm the shoemaker's elf. Ah because there are shoes, but you never see anybody making them. My website is enchantedflorafarm.com, all one word. Um, and, and it has my phone number there. Give me a call and we can set something up. I call it the VIP treatment because you'll be the only one there and it'll be one-on-one. -on -one, and that's what I'm best with anyway. Excellent. I don't like crowds. Well, I understand that your farm is a little bit different yes. in that it's a greenhouse operation. Mm -hmm. Indeed. How big is your greenhouse? I have four of them. Uh, one, a 28 by 40, a 20 by 40, a 12 by 40, and a small uh, 18 by 24. How close are they located to your actual home? About a football field, 300 feet. How do you get there in the winter? Uh, in the winter, I am inside reading books <laughs> and watching documentaries. Uh, don't do much in the winter. Start up in March. Now, what is material do you use to create a greenhouse? Is it glass, plastic? Uh, 
No, this is which the whole industry has gone to probably in the last three decades is steel and plastic. Um, insurance companies stopped um, covering glass greenhouses because when glass falls, it does bad things to people. Um, and, and they got tired of paying claims. And when hail falls, Oy. that does bad things to glass. Yes, my, uh, my plastic survived the hail. We had 50 um, cent sized hail a few years back when we had the big hail storm on, I think it was May 27th. Trust Rutland to take pennies from heavens to extremes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, now, did you inherit this as a family business, or did you start this completely on your own? Um, I started it mostly on my own, but it's um, chosen family. Uh, Harold Billings and Mary Ashcroft, uh, when I moved to this area as a transplant with a relationship, they knew what I wanted to do, and they helped me out tremendously to get started. Uh, and then it's grown, no pun, it's grown from there. And I did do uh, produce in the field, about an acre and a half, two acres, uh, plus I grew plants, plus I had a full-time job for health insurance. But at a certain point, I was doing none of them well anymore. So I gave up the produce because that was the thing that took the most time. And I had to have insurance, so. Did you study agriculture formally at college? No, no. Um, it's something I've always been interested in, uh, and I've been blessed with what has been called a freakishly good and detailed memory. Uh, at least that's what friends tell me. I started when I was four or five years old. I stole some navy bean seeds out of the cupboard in my mom's kitchen and planted them in my sandbox. And <laughs> from grow. then on, my mom always made sure I had a little patch uh, to grow things in, or that's the, the family legend anyway. Oh, okay, she encouraged you from an early age. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any particular, do you ever use pesticides? Or, no. All right, and the reason for that is? I use, well, I'm, I'm organic. All right, so um, that's how you are built. There are organic pesticides. Uh, they could be very, very expensive. Um, they're great on a small scale, on a large scale, they're a little more difficult. When, when I feel I'm gonna have an insect problem, I order ladybugs. Uh -huh. um, are there ladybug ladybugs, farmers? There are actually in, in California and they overnight them here. And um, last year I had what I would refer to as a biblical plague of aphids. Never had aphid problems before. And last year I had so many, I didn't know what to do. I was, I was really in a panic. So I ordered 36,000 ladybugs. This year I preemptively ordered 18,000 ladybugs. And I think I found aphids on only six plants the whole season. So Sounds like they that were doing their thing. job. I used to live in Cheap California. Insurance. And mm. I've uh, been to the, in the redwoods. They have lots of ladybug colonies. I'm, yes, yes. These are um, commercially grown. They don't take them from the wild. Oh, okay. We wouldn't want our ladybug population to no, disappear. that would be bad. Now, besides selling your produce at Grace Church in our parking lot, mm -hmm. is there some other place where you offer your produce for sale, or do people have to come to Enchanted Flora Farm? Um, plants is what I do anymore. I don't do finished produce, um, which actually makes me sad. I haven't had my own garden in probably 16 years now because my time and the season is... You know, it starts in March and it doesn't end until the end of July. And by the time you get around the end of July, there's not much you can do. You could plant some late peas or other root crops like beets, you know, some carrots at that point. But I miss having a garden. But I just do plants. I grow and sell plants, uh, hanging baskets, uh, flowers, vegetables, you name it. Have you tried hydroponics? I, I have not um, because everything I've read about it says it works better um, on a larger scale. There's a place on Whipple Hollow that's been there a long time and they do mainly tomatoes and they do a fantastic job. Um, and for, they can be grown all year long oh in yes. the winter? Oh yes, yep, they grow them year round, uh, which is good for them. But uh, you can grow greens hydroponically. I don't know, I just like soil. <laughs> I don't call it dirt. Dirt is in your yard. Soil, which I grow in, you pay a good price for. Uh, and I use McEnroe's uh, organic potting soil. And it has all the nutrients. Everybody asks me what I use to fertilize my plants, and that would be nothing. They're growing in their fertilizer. 
It's specifically formulated and it's um, plant and manure based. And it's got rock powders and stuff like that in it. And uh, you pay for it, but it works. I never have to put fertilizer on my plants. That's wonderful. Now, uh, what special vegetables, I'm calling them the big mm -hmm. guns, mm -hmm. have you brought to introduce to our Northwest Community Garden? I brought a, a very nice hybrid uh, melon. It's a cousin of cantaloupe. It's the French Charente melon which usually takes a long time, 90 days or longer, because they're grown along the Mediterranean area of France. But these have been hybridized uh, by an organic company out of Washington State. The name is Alvaro, A-L-V-A-R-O, if anybody wants to look it up. Uh, Territorial Seeds is the company, and it's very short. It's 65 to 70 days, which we can do in our climate here, um, especially since we're getting longer and longer falls and it's delicious. They are, I'm gonna say three pounders, so they're not giants, but anymore you don't need giant produce. And what kind of vine space do you have to provide for this cantaloupe? About seven feet. Okay, now are, are you bringing anything else? Pumpkins or watermelons? Uh, yes, you had requested pumpkin, uh, so I brought another hybridized short vine pumpkin from Johnny Seeds out of Maine and it's called Racer, and it's ready in 85 days, which most pumpkins are 100, 110 days. These are like the flash. They get 14 to 16 pounds, you know, good standard jack-o'-lantern type. Excellent. Did you bring any other kind of I, I did not, um, mainly because at this point in the season, I, I kind of ran out of a lot of things. That's Okay. Um, I had some wonderful uh, watermelons called Mini Love, uh, and that's an award winner. And they get about four to five pounds, and the vine only goes three to four feet. I did those last year as, a, as an experiment in a 10-inch pot. Wow. And I had three plants in the 10-inch pot. I had to keep throwing water at it, but no fertilizer other than that compost they're growing in. And I got like seven nice melons off of that plant and they were delicious very thin skin compared to a regular melon so you could eat it almost to the skin of the rind some of the vegetables that you've discussed are rather big and heavy what is the best way to transport these big guns when they are ready to harvest um the only one really would be the the biggest would be 14 to 16 pound pumpkin Okay. Um, which is good. They're going to be, I don't know, probably 12 inches around and 12 inches high. So that's not bad. But I know some people, including myself when I was younger, tried to grow the Big Max pumpkins and even the Dills Atlantic Giant, which you see at the fairs with the red ribbons. And those things can weigh literally a ton, um, you know, 1,900, 2,100 pounds. Is there some special technique that farmers have to deliberately encourage these pumpkins to overgrow? Yes, they make a small slit in the vine. Uh, they take um, a wick like you would see in a kerosene lantern and they slip it into the vine, kind of like you're gonna give a transfusion. Mm -hmm. And then that goes into a jar, or in this case, because it's needing so much a bucket, of milk. The calcium helps reinforce this, the shell of the pumpkin, otherwise they're so big they'd collapse in on themselves. The other thing they do is often put a blanket on them at night and soak it with, a, I think it's calcium citrate, which then permeates that skin of the pumpkin, again, thickening it and making it harder. Uh, these pumpkins aren't meant for eating <laughs> by anyone or anything. Um, they're just meant for show. You're growing them for ego. <laughs> okay, Mike, can you tell me what we're going to do uh, in the process of transplanting some Dragon's Ton seedlings mm -hmm. into a temporary container that I can take home and then put into another garden. Um, Dragon's Tongue is a variety I've grown myself. It's a wonderful heirloom bean. Um, so that's a good thing that you're gonna have those. The thing with beans, you're gonna wanna get as much soil as possible because beans and transplanting don't always get along well together. That's why you see them mostly direct seeded, but we're gonna do what we can to get these babies a new home. And I'm gonna recommend that you transplant them as quickly as possible after you get them home. Okay. Uh, other than that, I brought 
like I mentioned, the Sharon Tay melons and the pumpkins that we're going to uh, plant. And I'm going to make sure there's no weeds in the area. We're going to create a little mound that's going to include, I brought some mudu, which is the best thing for vining crops because they're heavy feeders. They need a lot of nutrition. And soil that you have in the ground is usually okay, but it usually lacks a lot of the uh, nutrients that they require. But mudu will turbo boost them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is the first plant that you're going to be? I think we should do the Sharon Tay melons. Okay, and then we will end with? The pumpkin. Okay, let's get gardening. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike, for joining us today. And we hope that other people will come and visit Enchanted Flora Farm. I hope so too. Thank you. <laughs>